I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime, and this is Currents. In this Hispanic Heritage Month, we visit a church where that heritage is at its heart. And how that heritage is experienced elsewhere in the country. The bishops of the United States, we understand the uh, Hispanics as a blessing for us. And he wears a white collar and has a green thumb. Nature helps me to be a, a good man, a good person. I am part of God's creation. Good evening, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, they're one of the largest immigrant groups in this city of immigrants, mm -hmm. and their influence in the church is only increasing. We're talking about Hispanics. We're marking Hispanic Heritage Month, and tonight, our Natalia Ortiz joins us with the latest installment of her continuing series on Hispanic culture. Hey, Natalia. Hi there. Thanks, Francesca. I recently had a chance to visit a parish that celebrates that culture in a way that's truly remarkable. If you want to know what parish in the Brooklyn Diocese Hispanics flock to the most, drop by the corner of 37th Avenue and 104th Street in Corona. Our Lady of Sorrows is so popular, it can create a Sunday traffic jam equal to that of a Monday morning in Manhattan. If you would ask me, Father, how come this church has so many people coming to it on Sunday, whatever? I think it's that lady there uh, with her arms outstretched, inviting because she touches hearts, hearts that have sorrows. Monsignor Healy is an Irish-American priest serving the Hispanic community at this parish, which offers seven masses on Sunday, five in Spanish. But before Monsignor Healy, there was Father Roberto Peláez. He was one of the priests who got it all started about 30 years ago, when Spanish-language masses were almost non-existent. It started with Father Herrero giving a chat limited to 10 minutes, then came the homily, later began a mass just on Sundays. Leda Taveras has been attending mass here for almost 40 years and remembers the difference in demographics. At that time, we have a lot of Italian, Irish, and Dominican people started coming in. Taveras, who also works at the church, explains one of the many reasons Our Lady of Sorrows appeals to Hispanic immigrants in the diocese. This might be one of the few churches that has a mass at 6.30 in the morning to give the opportunity to people who work on Sunday to come to church before they go to work. René Peñareda says part of the reason he comes to this parish is because it allows him and his family to continue living their Catholic faith just the way they did back home in Ecuador. We are devotees of the Virgin of the Swan and of the Cloud too, so they always arrive here, so we come here to pray to them. And others like it because of the feeling of comfort it offers them during tough times. This is a nice church because we come here and we feel consoled because we're far from our families, alone. This church's lay people and clergy alike offer not just spiritual support, but guidance in practical matters too. If they need help, not that we're going to resolve our problem with the immigration, but at least so they know where to go. But as far as where to go on Sunday, the packed house at this church says it all. And back to you, Francesca. All right, Natalia, thanks so much. We'll look forward to more stories from you on Hispanic Heritage Month. And uh, we'll also have more on Hispanics and faith later on in the show. We'll look at how they're influencing the church across the country. But stay tuned just ahead on Currents when we return, picking up the pieces in the Philippines after one of the worst floods in decades. We'll have that and the rest of the day's headlines. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime. Coming up a little bit later, Pope Benedict's spidey sense was not tingling over the weekend. This is so funny, we'll show you why. His spidey sense, it's great. <laughs> but first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. Well, the Katrina of the Philippines, that's what many are calling a typhoon that hit the Philippines' main island, which has left the country's capital of Manila underwater. Catholic Relief, Relief Services has pledged $250,000 along with food, blankets, mosquito nets, and other basic necessities there. CNN's Dan Rivers has more. 
The death toll here in Manila has now risen to 240, with hundreds of thousands of people uh, displaced, many uh, living in temporary shelters. The government is coming in for stinging criticism that it didn't act soon enough and that there was no coherent plan in place uh, over the weekend. Now it's playing uh, catch up. It's uh, opened up part of the presidential palace uh, for the distribution uh, of aid. Uh, in full glare uh, of the local uh, media as the defence secretary here tries to uh, allay concerns that they haven't done enough. All that combined though, the uh, floodwaters are receding uh, rapidly, but everyone here is now looking very closely at two more tropical storms which are loitering out in the Pacific. Uh, one of them could uh, come this way, perhaps even hitting Manila again uh, in just a, a few days' time. Uh, and meanwhile, across the city, uh, thousands of people are beginning the long, slow process of clearing up all of the mud and debris uh, in their homes and trying to get back uh, to normal. Uh, and as well as that, some harrowing scenes as people start to bury their dead. At last report, the death toll had actually risen to 284. 23 provinces in the Philippines have declared a state of calamity. Well, the Vatican's permanent observer to the UN says other churches, not the Catholic Church, had the worst problems with clergy sex abuse. Archbishop Silvano Tomasi, citing statistics, said most sexual abuse in the U.S. happened actually in Protestant churches. He added most abuse was from family members, babysitters and friends, and not from clergy. The Vatican has released the Pope's message for the next World Day of Social Communications. Priests are encouraged to use new media like texting and email in their ministry and, face to, and fit to face new challenges rather arising from the digital culture. World Day of Social Communications actually takes place next May. A bishop in Bosnia is warning Catholics not to treat supposed apparitions of Mary at a church in Medjugorje as real. The Vatican has not approved the alleged apparitions, which many claim have been taking place daily for nearly three decades. The bishop questioned a priest at the church who was publishing a monthly commentary on the messages. Well, a relic of what many believe is Jesus' cross has been stolen from a monastery in Madrid, Spain. A Spanish newspaper reports the relic was stolen the day after the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross. It is believed that whomever took it disguised himself as a monk to sneak out that relic. Well, Newt Gingrich is jumping in with both feet. Just months after the former House Speaker converted to Catholicism, Gingrich has announced that he's producing a documentary on Pope John Paul. The film will detail John Paul's first visit to his homeland of Poland after being elected Pope. Gingrich will co-host the documentary with his wife. There you go. <laughs> well, stay tuned. There's more currents coming up straight ahead. Coming up, one bishop talks about the blessing of Latinos. The first um, thing that the Hispanics bring to the United States is a deep and solid faith. Welcome back. Well, as we heard at the top of the show, Hispanics are turning out in greater numbers at area churches. That's right. And earlier in the summer, Notre Dame University hosted a conference on this diverse culture. And as we hear from H2O News, the leaders of the church are recognizing, now more than ever, how great an impact Hispanics are having on the church today. Hispanic Catholics are a blessing. This is what Jose Gomez, Archbishop of San Antonio, Texas, stated in an interview during the Camino Aomeos conference held at the University of Notre Dame this summer. First and most important thing is that the bishops of the United States, we understand the uh, Hispanics as a blessing for us, for the church in the United States. Uh, Hispanics and Latinos are people of faith, with deep cultural traditions that are based on the, uh, on the foundation of faith. So that's a a new thing in the church in the United States. Uh, uh, so I think the first, the first um, thing that the Hispanics bring to the United States is a deep and solid faith. Uh, I think the aspects that are really exciting for us are first of all uh, the uh, young people. Uh, there are different organizations in the United States that uh, gather together uh, youth and young adults uh, that are really excited about their faith. Archbishop Gomez, born in Monterrey, Mexico, 
points out that this Latino blessing is above all young. Um, just a few years ago, here at Notre Dame University, we had a national congress, um, uh, Encuentro Juvenil. Um, we gathered more than 6,000 young people, and, and you can see the vitality and the energy that they bring to the life of the church. So that's an aspect that is also a, 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 a blessing for the church in the United States. The vitality that the Archbishop praises was confirmed at the Biblical Conference in Indiana with an insistence of 300 people, among them many new generations. Under the guidance of the American Bible Society and the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism, successful initiatives undertaken by the Latino world in the United States were brought to light, including the reinforcement of the laity's leadership and English-Spanish bilingual publications. Well, one of the things that they had just done, which you was saying this, you know, bilingual publications, right. is they sort of change the uh, the Bible, I guess, to, that we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, so right. that it has more to do with the Hispanic culture, not just from Spain, but also, you know, the representation of the diaspora here in the States and uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Right, the new translation. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it's it's amazing to me, because I'm, I'm actually from the, the area where I'm from in, in Georgia, uh, north of Atlanta, is um, very uh, heavily Hispanic. And I, I'll tell you, I've always known Hispanics to be great people of faith, mm -hmm. th those that, that have been, uh, you know, in my life. I've went to school with a lot of Hispanics. Sure. And, and, and th there always have been, in my life, in my personal experience, great people of faith. So it's great to see the church focusing more on that culture and really bringing that out. And, of course, this month we get to recognize that. Yeah, it's so vibrant. And the other thing is, is you know, you have Central Americans, you know, South Americans, uh, all the islands. Uh, a lot of the Latinos and Hispanics that come here, obviously they're immigrants, some of them. Some of them are poor. Many of them are. Many of them are not. But right. a lot of the times, when you do find a, a you know socioeconomically uh, not so well off population people do turn to their faith that much more often it happened right. with my italian immigrants and my latino immigrants you know years ago when they came on ellis island and whatnot right. and now it's happening here too and it's just nice to know that the church is still there as that you know bed of faith and that rock of the community for so many people that are getting their uh, their footing absolutely absolutely they've got to have got to hold on to it that's right we'll stay tuned there's much more currents coming up straight ahead <laughs> Coming up, as we get closer to the Feast of St. Francis, we'll learn how one priest looks at nature and finds hope. It makes me appreciate what God has, has done for me, and it, it lifts up my soul. The Feast of St. Francis of Assisi is this weekend, and at many parishes around the diocese, you can actually take your dog, your cat, iguana, or pet <laughs> of your choice for a blessing at church. I think you're going to take Luisa. She, she deserves a blessing. She's such a great kitty. She does, and she's <laughs> been through a big move <laughs> that, lately. So. She, yeah, exactly. Well, Francis is actually my namesake, St. Francis. Uh, it, he's the patron saint of animals. And last night, you'll remember, we met a priest who, like St. Francis, is in touch with nature. We subjected this priest, Monsignor Stephen Ferrari, to a day in the wild with Lino Ruli, which you missed, but it was funny. Oh, poor guy, I can only imagine. <laughs> well, we also had the opportunity to let Monsignor Ferrari tell his story in his own words about how his hobby, birding, and his faith are intertwined. So tonight, he is our eyewitness. I hope everybody has a hobby or a pastime so that they can get away from the regular routine, and mine happens to be birding. I grew up in Brooklyn, so there wasn't that much nature, but uh, my family had a place up in Putnam County, north of Westchester County, and we would spend most of our summers there as kids. As a child, I was always attracted to nature, and I always used to go out and look at the birds, look at the trees, look at the flowers. I see a real connection between God and spirituality and, and nature and bird watching. We are natural beings, and that's where I find my, my joy out here. In the scriptures, of course, birds are mentioned quite a bit. Jesus referred to the birds when he spoke about not being concerned about what you need to wear or, or what you need to eat. And it calms me down and I realize, well, God is taking care of me. And whatever happens to me, God is protecting me. God, I'm in God's hands. This helps me to center myself in God. It makes me appreciate what God has, has done for me. And it lifts up my soul and I turn to God in prayer. 
in thanksgiving for, for the beauty he has created. Um, it connects me very much with God's presence. People can remember me as the bird watching a priest or Monsignor, if they wish. I uh, hope that I'm much more than that to people. I, I believe that nature helps me to be a, a good man, a good person, because, again, it brings me back to who I am. I am part of God's creation, just as nature is. Every, every blade of grass is part of God's creation. I think that helps me to locate myself in the universe. It helps me to locate myself in relationship to other people and to things and to the world. And so I feel that um, if I can see God's goodness in everything around me, in the beauty of a bird, in the beauty of a, of a plant, of a tree, of a flower, then I know that there is goodness. And even when there is evil in the world, I know that goodness will triumph because nature triumphs. Life comes back again. And that's good. Because God said it was good. He created he created and he said, this is good. This is very good. And that provides me with a measure of comfort and a measure of hope. Hope in humanity, hope in the world, hope in uh, everything that's happening in our very troubled world where there is a great deal of, of tragedy, a great deal of evil. But that provides me with a sense of, of hope, yes. Yeah. Mm. And listening to what he had to say it reminded me of uh, the song, you know, His Eyes on the Sparrow. Oh, uh, yeah. And I know he watches me. So it's, uh, it's an amazing thing that, that he feels that close connection with God through nature. It's awesome. Yeah, a lot of well, us Well, Monsignor do. Steve Ferrari there, our eyewitness. And actually this past weekend, the Pope showed <laughs> that he could be at one with nature too. A little bit. During <laughs> a speech in the Czech Republic, the Pope had an unexpected guest. As we hear from CNN's Jeannie Mose, Benedict was cool as a cucumber. Substitute Pope for water spout, and you'll pretty much have the picture. The itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. Only in this case, no rain washed him out. Well, there's no simple answer to that question. As the Pope spoke in the medieval Prague Castle, the spider kept reappearing. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. Going down the pontiff's arm. Out came the sun and dried up all the rain. And then back up again. And the itsy bitsy spider went up the spout again. Who could pay attention to the Pope's words? And spiritual dimensions. When the spider's dimensions were so mesmerizing, whether you call it itsy bitsy or incy wincy or eensy wincy, when it finally crawled on the pontiff's face, heading for his ear, he swatted at it, though the camera cut away and missed the swat. It's probably a good thing for the Pope's image not to have pulled an Obama. Nice. <laughs> of course, the spider that made a papal visit was endlessly revisited on YouTube, with folks adding them music from Jaws. Or some misspelled commentary. Arachnophobia. Gave way to arachnopopia. <laughs> Eight legs, two fangs and an attitude. Not since an arachnid stole the show waiting for the space shuttle Atlantis to launch two years ago has a spider caused such a stir. And this just in, we kid you not, the Vatican has actually issued an itsy bitsy statement on the spider. In the words of Father Lombardi, Vatican spokesperson, the Pope had no problem that the spider wanted to take a walk on him. Actually, it even walked out with him. And whether you find spiders scary, or cute. <laughs> At least the pontiff didn't spout this. So I got the sucker. Amen. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's, I've got like the heebie-jeebies now. I know you do. It was a very persistent Ugh. spider. I know. It just kept going up and down and around. <laughs> and I mean, they didn't even, you'd think that after he swatted at it, somebody would actually have picked it off, but I guess not. Exactly. I guess you don't want to do that in the middle of a, See, middle of the Pope, you know, Saint giving Francis, it. it's the respect for all life. It's right. uh, all animals are created equal. <laughs> I, sometimes I do that. I don't want to, like, you know, throw it away or crush it. I just try to 
bring it outside. Right, right. The, the humane thing to do, right? Try to, but uh, the humane thing to do uh, would have been perhaps to uh, <laughs> see you in action live over the weekend, but I did not. But I have heard uh, the tunes that you have sung. Well, thank you. Yeah, I was in Atlanta, as you know. Um, the Metropolitan Atlanta Theater Awards, and uh, I think we've got a clip of it actually to show here. Yeah, that would be nice. Let's take a look. Mr. Matthew McClure! so impressed I could never do that it's amazing <laughs> you have such a gorgeous voice well thank you thank you yeah. very much yeah it was so much fun and um, you know I got to see friends that I was in theater with in Atlanta of course which is where I'm from mm -hmm. and um, Russ Ivy who is uh, at, uh, the head of the theater awards there um, it's just awesome sent me that clip today and, and was able to show it but he um, I, I was actually up for an award which I was uh, which I didn't win but you know Aww, Maddie, uh, we love you you have the award of best current <laughs> co-anchor <laughs> thank you thank you <laughs> It's so the best current co anchor for the day. Yeah, right? we'll oh, share. We'll share that one. We'll okay. go back and forth. All right, right. But no, um, it was a lot of fun though, and I got to see a lot of my great friends and perform, and it was just really, really cool. I, I really enjoyed being back up on stage again. That is so nice. I bet, and I hope that you get to do some stuff over here. I mean, the Great White Way has nothing on you. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know about all that, but no, I, um, <laughs> you know, I love being on stage, and I love, I love singing and. It uh, was great. My parents were there, too, so um, hey. it was great that they got to see that. Very nice. So. Very nice. I like, I like, All I right. like. Well, that is it for this edition of Currents. Now, tomorrow, as September winds to a close, we'll be actually looking ahead to October, which is Respect Life Month. And until tomorrow, remember, you can always catch us online. Just head to CurrentsNY.net, where you can see clips of the show and also check out our blog, Writing the Wave, and you can also meet the people that make the show happen. All right, and you can also follow us on Twitter as well. Just head on over to twitter.com slash currents and why. Well, for all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime. Thank you so much for joining us this Tuesday, and have a great night.